I guess uh, I can start. Um, so it's an honor to um, introduce Dr. Strasberg, um, who is here today. He's a professor at uh, Moffitt Cancer Center. He is a specialist in neuroendocrine malignancies. Um, he graduated from Harvard and Cornell and had his fellowship at Moffitt and stayed there. And now he leads uh, the neuroendocrine tumor division at Moffitt and the GI department um, research program. Uh, Dr. Strasberg has published over 200 uh, articles and book chapters, and he's a leader in the management of neuroendocrine tumors, and he's the first author of the um, breakthrough landmark article on neuroendocrine tumor management for the PRRT and the approval of the PRRT. Um, um, he's, uh, he is a vice chair at the NANETS and serves at, at the Neuroendocrine Guideline Committees for uh, NCCN and the, in, in the Neuroendocrine Tumor Task Force at the NCI, and co-chairs the Neuroendocrine Tumor Section at the Southwest Oncology Group. Uh, we are uh, honored to have Dr. Strasberg talk to us about the new advances in neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the invitation to uh, give grand rounds and uh, talk about um, basically uh, the state of neuroendocrine tumor treatment, particularly metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor treatment in 2021. And so I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Uh, let's see. Um, can people see my screen? No, sir. No, oh, one second. Still no, huh? No. All right, let me see. Share screen. How about now? Still not? No, not yet. All right, let's see, what am I doing now? Now you can, right? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, let me just go back to the first slide. All right. So uh, here's my disclosure slide. And I just wanted to start with a, a case of a metastatic, well differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that illustrates the multidisciplinary approach to neuroendocrine tumor treatment. So this was a 47-year-old man uh, presented over a decade ago with intermittent abdominal pain associated with uh, uh, sweats. Uh, CAT scan showed a five centimeter tumor in the pancreatic tail with large retroperitoneal lymph nodes and several uh, scattered hypervascular lesions in the left hepatic lobe. Uh, liver biopsy showed a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor with one mitosis per 10 high power field. And Octria scan showed strong radio tracer uptake, in other words, strong somatostatin receptor expression. Octriscan was the imaging modality that was used at the time. These days we use uh, dotatate PETs, either gallium-68 or uh, copper-64. Sorry. So treatment options were discussed at the time. Those include surgical debulking, uh, we also discussed possible preoperative treatment followed by surgical debulking, particularly to shrink the primary tumor, which was invading adjacent organs. Uh, or we talked about uh, systemic uh, treatments without surgery, including first-line somatostatin analog and several other drugs, including sunitinib, everolimus, lutetium dotatate, or capecitabine temozolomide that are generally given in the second or third-line setting. So the patient was started on octreotide, uh, somatostatin analog. Um, it's used both to control hormonal syndromes and tumor growth, and he had stable disease after three months. The case was discussed in tumor board and surgery was recommended if the patient responded to neoadjuvant treatment. So we received three cycles of capecitabine temozolomide, uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, had a minor response, then had external beam radiation to the primary tumor with radiosensitizing capecitabine, and had a partial response, 
He went ahead and received the distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, as well as a wedge resection and ablation of several liver lesions. In other words, uh, debulking surgery, not quite curative intent, because I don't think they were able to get every last liver tumor or lymph node, but um, the goal was to um, improve long-term outcome. He was maintained on octreotide after surgery. His disease remained stable for five years, as is often the case with these tumors. But then in 2015, he developed growth of tumors in the left lobe of the liver. We again went over uh, a lot of different options, including more surgery, um, either a left epitectomy or parenchymal spraying surgery, or liver embolization, or various systemic treatments. He declined surgery. Um, he underwent a bland left liver embolization. He eventually progressed in the right liver and as well as lymph nodes. He started Everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, progressed a year later. Uh, we repeated some metastatin receptor imaging, this time with a gallium-68 dotatate PET scan, which again confirmed strong somatostatin receptor expression. And he received peptide receptor radiotherapy with lutetium dotatate for four treatments. He had a partial response which actually persists uh, to this day. So this sort of reflects the journey of a patient with a, a relatively slow growing cancer um, over multiple lines of treatment. Obviously a patient with a pretty good outcome, not a, every patient has this uh, persistent response to different therapies, but not that atypical either. And it illustrates the, the different disciplines that can be used to treat metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, including, of course, medical oncology, but also um, uh, radiation oncology, nuclear medicine, interventional radiology, so it often take, and surgery. So it often takes multiple specialties to optimally treat these patients. Now, neuroendocrine tumors are not really one cancer. They're a, they're a family of cancers uh, and a very heterogeneous one at that. So uh, we often... Uh, uh, sort of categorize patients or think of patients in terms of the extent of disease, whether it's limited or metastatic, whether it's liver dominant, in which case you can use liver directed therapy or widely metastatic, uh, whether the pace of growth is relatively slow or fast. Uh, the primary site uh, makes a difference. Each of these primary sites is both clinically and biologically distinct, different uh, rates of malignant disease, different rates of aggressiveness, different biology. Uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have mutational uh, patterns that are completely different, for example, from midgut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, grade and differentiation are extremely important. Grade refers to the proliferative activity of the cancer based on the, either mitotic rate or key 67 index. And we distinguish between low grade with a key 67 of 0 to 2%, intermediate grade is 3 to 20% or high grade. Um, and then uh, differentiation refers to the extent to which the cancer resembles the uh, endocrine cells of origin. Well differentiated uh, means that the cells are very similar to the normal endocrine cells, um, usually um, uh, uh, very monomorphic, um, uh, well organized in islets or trabeculae, poorly differentiated, often pleomorphic, a lot of necrosis, um, sheets of cells. Um, so well differentiated uh, are typically lower intermediate grade, but you can get high grade well differentiated tumors. Poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, and we use the term carcinoma to describe poorly differentiated, are invariably high grade. Hormone status uh, neuroendocrine tumors are, are famous for uh, producing hormones such as serotonin in the case of uh, mid primarily midgut neuroendocrine tumors resulting in flushing and diarrhea, the so called carcinoid syndrome. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can produce many hormones as well, such as gastrin, uh, which is associated with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome or insulin. Um, and so we distinguish between functional, meaning hormone producing, or non-functional, non-hormone producing. And then somatostatin receptor expression. Uh, high expression, um, meaning strongly positive on somatostatin receptor imaging or low or absent uh, expression. So I don't have time to really talk about different types of neuroendocrine tumors. So the focus of this talk is gonna be on, on systemic therapy of patients with metastatic disease. And so metastatin analogs uh, have been sort of the cornerstone of treatment for the last several decades. Um, they were initially developed uh, to control 
hormonal syndromes. It was found in the late 1970s that somatostatin uh, can inhibit uh, serotonin release as well as other hormones and palliate the carcinoid syndrome. But then around 2010, several randomized clinical trials showed that they can also inhibit tumor growth. So the problem with normal human somatostatin is it has a very short half-life. So somatostatin analogs of creatide and lenreotide were developed that have much longer half-life. And then depot forms were developed that can be administered every four weeks as an, as a, as an injection. So again, the initial indication for octreotide, the first somatostatin analog was for control of carcinoid syndrome. So flushing diarrhea and reduction in urine 5-hydroxy acetic acid, which is a metabolite of uh, uh, serotonin. And in this small phase two study of 25 patients, the large majority experienced clinical benefit as far as palliation of their flushing or diarrhea. But then the PROMIT study published in 2009 um, looked at depot octreotide once every four, four weeks versus placebo uh, for control of tumor growth in patients with metastatic midgut neuroendocrine tumors. Midgut means originating in the small bowel or proximal colon. Um, and what it found is that uh, there was a very significant improvement in time to progression. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0.34, it was statistically significant. And so this was the first conclusive evidence that uh, uh, somatostatin analogs can significantly delay time to tumor growth. They don't actually shrink tumors. The objective response rate is less than 1%, uh, but they stabilize tumors. And this was again confirmed uh, with the clarinet study, which looked at the other somatostatin analog. We used lanreotide uh, versus placebo in the more heterogeneous population of patients with uh, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors low and low intermediate grade. So key 67, less than 10%. They were randomized to lanreotide 120 milligrams versus placebo with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival. And this study also showed a statistically significant improvement in PFS. This was a pretty indolent population to start with. The median PFS on placebo was 18 months, but it wasn't reached with lanreotide. The hazard ratio was 0.47. And so again, a statistically significant improvement in PFS. And when they did subgroup analysis, the population of midgut nets had exactly the same hazard ratio for PFS as the PROMIT study did with octreotide. So we can say that almost certainly these drugs are very similar, if not identical in their efficacy. Uh, in pancreatic nets, the hazard ratio was not quite as, as strong, um, but um, but the study was not really powered to um, um, look at each individual primary subsite. And so based on this study, lanreotide was approved uh, for treatment of gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the strengths of somatostatin analogs are that they're well tolerated, um, they're uh, low risk, uh, we have a high level of evidence supporting their use um, in form of the PROMIT and CLARINET study, and that they're palliative for patients with uh, functional tumor syndrome, syndrome. So they can palliate carcinoid syndrome as well as other syndromes, such as gastrinoma, uh, VIPoma associated with uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide in pancreatic nets, glucagonoma. So all sorts of very rare syndromes. Um, uh, the somatostatin analogs have very non-specific effect of reducing the secretion of other hormones. And as far as tolerability, um, the side effect profile is, is, is quite tolerable. Some patients get a little bit of cramping and nausea, typically with the first injection. Uh, they often develop steatorrhea, meaning malabsorption of fat. Uh, in other words, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency that can easily be treated with pancreatic enzymes, such as Creon. Um, but bear that, that, that's an important thing to remember. Um, patients often develop um, steatorrhea, and it's important not to confuse that with carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, for example. Um, and uh, some of these side effects that are, occur early on generally subside over time. The weaknesses are a low radiographic response rate. Uh, we almost never see uh, tumor responses, even minor tumor responses. And the evidence supporting their use is primarily in patients with pretty slow growing tumors and especially with key 67 under 10%. That was the upper limit uh, 
on the clarinet study. So they're most appropriate and usually as a first line therapy for patients with low, low intermediate grade tumors, pretty slow growing and somatostatin receptor expression on scans, typically a first line therapy. So moving on, another important uh, drug is the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus. Uh, we know that 15% of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are associated with mutations in mTOR pathway enzymes, such as uh, PI3 kinase. Um, but a much larger percentage of patients have upregulation of the mTOR pathway, even though we can't identify discrete mutations. So there were three um, phase, pivotal phase three studies that evaluated the efficacy of Everolimus in gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The first was uh, Radian 2, uh, in which patients with carcinoid syndrome and metastatic neuroendocrine tumor were randomized to Everolimus plus octreotide versus placebo plus octreotide. So this study, because it required a history of carcinoid syndrome, ended up enrolling mostly mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, in other words, the, the, the least aggressive kind, and that might have impacted the results. Um, there was crossover built in in patients who progressed on placebo. And what this study showed was an improvement in PFS, but it actually fell just short of statistical significance. Um, and the hazard ratio was 0.77. So, you know, a little bit on the marginal side in terms of, of, of benefit. Uh, another, the next study uh, published almost simultaneously was Radian 3, in which patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, were randomized to Everolimus versus placebo, also with crossover uh, permitted on the placebo arm after progression. This was a much more positive study. Uh, the median uh, uh, PFS on placebo was 4.6 months. Uh, it improved to 11 months with Everolimus. The p-value was highly statistically significant, and the hazard ratio was 0.35. So this led to approval of Everolimus for patients with uh, metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And then finally, Radian 4 looked at the final piece of the puzzle, advanced neuroendocrine tumors with no history of carcinoid syndrome. So this was mostly non-midgut nets. So it's a, a very heterogeneous group of lung nets, colorectal nets, gastroduodenal nets, uh, pancreatic nets were not included in the study. They were randomized to Everolimus versus placebo. No octreotide was allowed, and there was no crossover on, on progression. And you can see that this was <coughs> quite similar to Radian 3. Uh, improvement in median PFS from 3.9 months on placebo, so a pretty aggressive population, to 11 months with Everolimus. Statistically significant. What about overall survival? So on Radian 2, which again was actually not a positive study for progression-free survival. Um, there was actually a, a numerically, numerical disadvantage for Everolimus compared to placebo when it came to overall survival. Now it's important to mention that none of these studies were powered to overall survive for overall survival. That, that's not possible generally in neuroendocrine tumor studies. So, so there's not that much we can conclude from the survival curves, but obviously a trend towards improved survival in the placebo arm is concerning and suggests that Everolimus might not be a, the greatest drug in this particular population. In Radian 3, um, where we had a, a strong PFS benefit, there was a, a trend towards overall survival benefit with Everolimus. And of course, we should remember that there was crossover on this study, which attenuates um, uh, the, the overall survival, uh, potential overall survival benefit. And on Radian 4, there was also evidence of potential um, um, uh, overall survival benefit, but we actually have not seen the final overall survival data on this study. This was an inter interim analysis of overall survival. What about adverse events? Um, Everolimus is often associated with canker sores in the mouth. We prescribe Decadron mouthwash to try to prevent that. There are many other side effects, including rash, diarrhea, uh, Everolimus is immunosuppressive, so there's increased risk of infection, including atypical infections. Um, and uh, pneumonitis is also relatively common. Clinically significant pneumonitis occurs in about 15% of patients. And hyperglycemia is, is also a fairly common side effect. So it can be tough to tolerate in some cases, and many patients require dose reductions. <clears throat> 
So there's strong evidence of use for use of everolimus in progressive pancreatic nets, as well as other non-midgut nets. Uh, there's relatively weak evidence for use in, in patients on the, who meet the RADIAN2 criteria, in other words, history of carcinoid syndrome, and it's mostly midgut nets. So I prefer to think about it as more as a slow growing midgut nets rather than think of it in terms of carcinoid syndrome. Um, the side effect profile may be challenging. You need to select patients with clinically significant disease progression. And, you know, frail elderly patients require close monitoring. Sunitinib is a VEGF inhibitor, VEGF receptor inhibitor, among other um, tyrosine kinase receptors. Um, neuroendocrine tumors are highly vascular, very similar to renal cell carcinoma. So it's no, not surprising that, that uh, VEGF uh, inhibitors play a role in this disease. Thus far, only sunitinib has been approved, um, although there are other antiogenic drugs that are likely to be approved in the future. And in this phase three study of sunitinib versus placebo in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the, the improvement in PFS was virtually identical to what we saw with everolimus and radian three, improvement from 5.5 months on placebo to 11 months with sunitinib, highly statistically significant. And this led to approval of sunitinib in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Sunitinib is an oral tyrosine uh, kinase receptor inhibitor. It has uh, similar side effects to many other TKIs. It causes hypertension. It can cause hand foot syndrome, and in other words, painful rash on the palms and soles. It can cause diarrhea, nausea, tiredness, cytopenias. Uh, so just like everolimus, it can be a difficult drug to um, tolerate at times. And I should mention, by the way, um, both sunitinib and everolimus are associated with response rates of more or less 10%. So these are primarily cytostatic drugs. They rarely result in objective tumor regression. How do we choose between sunitinib and everolimus for pancreatic nets? Uh, really more based on side effect profile than anything else. So moving on to cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, We've known for a long time that certain drugs, particularly alkylating agents, are much more active in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors than in GI neuroendocrine tumors, and particularly mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors are, are fairly chemo-resistant. Um, in the old days, streptozosin was the main drug used in pancreatic nets. In the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, temozolomide has become a much more commonly used drug. It's an it's a oral um, alkylating agent with a better side effect profile. And so various temozolomide-based uh, chemotherapy combinations have been used, but the combination of temozolomide with capecitabine, which is an oral fluoropyrimidine, has really shown the highest level of activity with response rates of up to 70% in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So data from single arm studies led to a randomized phase two study, the ECOG 2211 study in patients with advanced progressive pancreatic nets. And they were randomized to temozolomide monotherapy versus capecitabine temozolomide with the primary endpoint of progression-free survival. The study met its primary endpoint. The median PFS in pancreatic nets was 22.7 months versus 14.4 months with temozolomide alone. Uh, this was statistically significant. You know, this, it's, it can be hard to do or, or inappropriate sometimes to do cross-trial comparisons, but I'm going to do it anyway and point out that on the very similar studies with uh, uh, sunitinib and everolimus, the median PFS was approximately a year. So we're seeing higher PFS with CAPTAM, although these have not been compared head-to-head -head yet to everolimus or sunitinib. There was also a statistically significant improvement in overall survival with cap versus TEM monotherapy. Although again, um, it's important to acknowledge this was a randomized phase two study, not a phase three study. So the, the conclusions we can reach for this are not as strong as a well-powered phase three study. There were 144 patients on this study. Despite being chemotherapy, cap is generally quite tolerable. Um, the main side effects are cytopenias. Um, we see grade four thrombocytopenia in approximately 10% of patients. 
In this study, there was a there was a little bit of a higher rate of neutropenia, but in my experience, thrombocytopenia is often the most common uh, significant side effect. And it's it's quite unpredictable. It generally occurs in the first cycle, and it's often quite late. It occurs peaks around week five after you start this uh, regimen. So the advantages of capecitabine temozolomide are high objective response rates. In pancreatic nets, it's about 50%. Generally well-tolerated, oral administration. And now we have evidence of improvement in PFS as well as overall survival in a randomized phase two study. The weaknesses are unpredictable grade three or four cytopenias, which can occur in 10 to 15% of patients. And so it's particularly appropriate for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, although there is evidence in other types of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, patients with relatively aggressive disease tend to respond quite well, including patients with, with well-differentiated high-grade tumors. Um, and if patients have high tumor burden or tumor-related symptoms, this is a good regimen to consider. It's important to prescribe it properly. Uh, first, this is a two-week on, two-week off regimen. Sometimes it's uh, prescribed inappropriately. And it's very important to give the anti-emetic ondansetron, Zofran, prior to temozolomide, otherwise patients become quite nauseous. Uh, also important to check um, uh, CBC right before each cycle within a few days because the cytopenias tend to be delayed. Moving on uh, to peptide receptor radiotherapy. Um, peptide receptor radiotherapy is really a very novel form of therapy, it's, you know, neuroendocrine tumors are really the first uh, to use this type of treatment, although it's, it's now being um, developed in other cancers, including prostate cancer, as some of you may be aware. Uh, so basically it relies on the fact that we have a target, the somatostatin receptor, we have a peptide, the somatostatin analog that interacts with the receptor, and then the somatostatin analog can be attached to a radionuclide. An initial radionuclide used was indium-111, the same uh, um, isotope used in Octreoscan, but that has very weak cytotoxic effect. And later, yttrium-90 and lutetium-177, which are both beta-emitting isotopes, uh, were developed that have a much higher rate of cytotoxicity and therefore uh, therapeutic efficacy. This study, this type of treatment was developed mostly in Europe, mostly in small uh, registries or retrospective studies, uh, generally showing uh, response rates in the, let's say more or less 20% uh, for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and particularly long uh, PFS durations in the range of two years on average. One of the largest databases uh, from Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, they treated over 1,200 patients. Among those, uh, almost 700 uh, lung and gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And they focused particularly on patients uh, for efficacy on patients who had received at least three cycles, which was uh, about 80, 85% of patients. The drug is given once every eight weeks for four treatments. They use the fixed treatment uh, dose, 200 millicuries. Some institutions use dosimetry. Amino acids, arginine, lysine are, are infused to prevent nephrotoxicity. And so the entire course of treatment is six months. And on this study, uh, what they found when they looked at various primary sites was response rates of um, approximately 30% in midgut neuroendocrine tumors, uh, even higher, approximately 50% in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and sort of intermediate response rates in, uh, in other neuroendocrine tumors. And as far as median PFS, it was approximately two and a half years in, in midgut neuroendocrine tumors, the same in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, a little bit lower in lung neuroendocrine tumors. Now, these are pretty high numbers. It's important to remember they were only looking at uh, patients who had received at least uh, three out of the four treatments. And that's an important critique. Uh, so, but even if we reduce the response rate by 20%, we're still talking about relatively high response rates and good outcomes. 
Peptide receptor radiotherapy is well tolerated. One of the main side effects is uh, cytopenias. Severe cytopenias are quite rare. They usually resolve uh, within the eight week time point, although some patients, probably five to 10% have persistent cytopenias. Usually these are not clinically significant as far as day-to-day life, but they can interfere with ability to administer other uh, subsequent treatments. But the most serious uh, consideration, toxicity consideration is long-term myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myelogenous leukemia. And this seems, seems to occur in about two to 3% of patients. Nephrotoxicity is a theoretical concern. We see that much more with yttrium 90 based PRRT. Uh, we, we really don't see any significant nephrotoxicity with uh, lutetium dotatate. There is evidence that somatostatin receptor expression on scans helps predict response, which is not surprising. Nowadays, uh, we use uh, gallium-based, uh, sorry, dotatate-based PET scans, um, such as gallium-68 or copper-64, rather than the octria scans in your pentatriotide. The criteria for PRT and octria scans used to be expression uh, equally strong to the normal liver, um, but uh, uh, pet, the PET scans have a higher sensitivity. Um, and what you wanna see is expression stronger than the normal liver. In other words, you should be able to see the tumor stand out as avid compared to the normal liver parenchyma. And ideally, you wanna see SUV values that are twice as high as the normal liver uh, for patients to be considered appropriate for this form of therapy. So the Netter 1 study was the first randomized phase three study of a radio-labeled somatostatin analog, specifically lutetium dotatate, the same uh, drug given in the same schedule as used in that Rotterdam um, registry that I described a few minutes ago. Uh, patients with progressive mid-gut, in other words, small bowel proximal colon neuroendocrine tumors uh, who had progressed on a standard dose somatostatin analog were randomized to receive either lutetium dotatate um, combined with standard dose octreotide or compared to high dose octreotide, 60 milligrams every four weeks. Um, patients uh, were required to have somatostatin receptor expression on octria scan. The primary endpoint was uh, progression free survival. So, this was the primary endpoint. Um, the median PFS uh, on high dose octreotide was eight months. Uh, it was not reached uh, with lutetium dotatate at the time of primary analysis. The hazard ratio was 0.21. In other words, there was roughly an 80% improvement in PFS or death. Objective response rate was 18% with lutetium versus 3% with high dose octreotide. And on preliminary analysis of overall survival, done at the same time as the PFS uh, analysis, the hazard ratio was 0.4 with a p value of 0 0.004. So the final analysis of overall survival was actually done uh, just a few months ago. It was the pre-specified threshold for final over analysis uh, was supposed to be at either 142 deaths or five years um, after um, last patient was randomized. Uh, and what ended up triggering the final overall survival analysis was the five-year time point. So the number of deaths has actually not been reached at the time this was done in 2021. So um, when we look at overall survival, uh, um, and again, this was just presented uh, uh, two months ago at ASCO for the first time. So this is relatively new data. Uh, the median overall survival in the patients randomized to lutetium dotatate was 48 months, four years. Uh, on the control arm, it was 36.3 months, so slightly over three years. So there was about a one year median overall survival benefit. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0.3. So this was not statistically significant, although it's important to recall that the study was primarily powered not for overall survival, but for progression-free survival. And as I'll show you in a minute, uh, there was a high rate of crossover on um, patients who initially uh, received high-dose octreotide. 
If we adjust for crossover using statistical uh, a methodology called RPSFT method, um, the number of patients who crossed over was at least 36% and probably higher than that. There was lots of information with long-term follow-up, but we noted at least 36% of patients crossed over to receive PRT after progressing on the control arm of the study. Uh, we can see a median improvement in overall survival uh, from this time, the overall survival goes down to 30 months on the control arm versus 48 months. So about a little bit over a year and a half improvement in median overall survival. It's really, uh, when, when, you, when you do the statistical analysis though, you, do, you don't typically attach a p-value to it. So as I said, uh, there was significant um, uh, crossover uh, including crossover to PRRT as well as, but of course, uh, patients on both arms received other systemic as well as local regional therapies. Um, and this only this this graph only looks at subsequent systemic therapies. Many patients underwent liver embolization, further surgery, and things of that nature. Uh, there were two cases of myelodysplastic syndrome reported in the initial analysis. There were no further cases reported with long-term follow-up. So the rate of myelodysplastic syndrome was 1.8%, which is in line with other uh, registries. Um, there was actually no indication of um, higher rates of nephrotoxicity with lutetium dotatate versus the control arm. So, you know, it's important to put this overall survival data in context. It was not clinically significant, but uh, overall survival benefit is not something that we're typically able to um, uh, able to prove in neuroendocrine tumor trials. So to take the PROMIT study, for example, uh, which showed a very substantial benefit in uh, time to progression, uh, the overall survival curves were virtually superimposed. This is of course, because uh, almost everyone who started out on placebo ended up getting a somatostatin analog after progression. And as we discussed uh, with uh, the Radiant 2 study, which showed a PFS trend uh, with um, Everolimus, favoring Everolimus, there was no overall evidence of overall survival benefit. So what we could say is that in the population of mid gut uh, nets, um, the Netter one study uh, was the closest we've come to showing an overall survival benefit, but uh, again, proving statistically significant benefit with a high rate of crossover uh, and a relatively um, small phase three study uh, showing overall survival benefit is in many cases, not a realistic expectation. So to conclude, um, in this final analysis of overall survival, uh, there was a one-year difference uh, favoring lutetium dotatate that was not statistically significant and no safety signals emerged during long-term follow-up. Now, I wanna point out that uh, peptide receptor radiotherapy with lutetium dotatate is not for everyone. Um, patients whose disease pattern is primarily in the root of the mesentery uh, these tumors contain a great deal of fibrotic tissue, uh, not relatively low amount of, um, of, of re really low percentage of cancer cells. These tumors virtually never shrink with systemic therapies, including uh, peptide receptor radiotherapy. Um, you know, you're unlikely to see a benefit in this scenario, although in many cases, you know, in some cases, it may be the only option. We found that extensive peritoneal disease is associated with a high rate of bowel obstruction, really bad bowel obstruction, probably caused by radiation peritonitis. So be very careful treating patients with uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis. Sometimes uh, we, we, we can reverse this with steroids and in many cases we'll prophylax with steroids, but in cases with a high tumor burden peritoneum, we've stopped treating those patients. You need to be sure that all tumors express somatostatin receptors. This is particularly an issue with relatively aggressive tumors, more with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or lung neuroendocrine tumors than mid-gut. In some cases with, uh, you know, grade two, uh, grade, you know, especially grade three, some people 
advocate for matching an FDG and, and a Dota tape PET scan to really make sure they're superimposed and that all tumors express the metastatin receptors. Because the, the ones that don't tend to be more aggressive. You can treat patients with high grade disease, but generally not very high grade. Case key 67, once it goes above 35, 40%, these patients don't do well with peptide receptor radiotherapy. Patients with high liver volume can do okay with uh, PRT, but if their liver is already damaged from prior embolizations, especially radioembolization, you have to be careful. And the renal issue turns out to be probably not as big a contraindication as we once thought it was. So nowadays we're treating patients with the creatinine clearance as low as 30%. It might even be safer to treat, safe to treat patients with lower creatinine clearance, but uh, we can't be sure of that. There's virtually no data. What you need to be, um, what you want to avoid though is patients with hydronephrosis because the radioactive isotope will, will remain um, Will will remain for a longer time uh, in the in the kidney, potentially causing damage. There's very exciting uh, data coming up with new alpha emitting PRT agents. These include uh, uh, actinium dotate as well as lead 212 dotate, and this is a phase one study of lead dotate uh, in patients who had already progressed on lutetium and showing really um, extraordinary outcomes in the maximal tolerated dose. So we're looking forward to phase two studies with this drug. So moving on to liver embolization, um, neuroendocrine tumors are often metastatic to the liver. The liver is often the dominant site of metastases. The liver has a dual blood supply. The tumors are primarily supplied by the hepatic arterial circulation, but no more liver parenchyma is supplied primarily by the portal vein. So you can selectively um, target uh, tumors with hepatic arterial embolization. And this is not just selective embolization of individual tumors. You can, you can target entire lobes. The data for this has almost exclusively been small retrospective studies. This is just a partial illustration of the huge number of small studies, but unfortunately no randomized large studies. Um, but in, over, in aggregate, the response rates seem to be more or less 50%, and symptomatic response rates are, are even a bit higher among patients with hormonal syndromes. Radioembolization um, with yttrium-90, either uh, stirspheres or therospheres, was promoted as a relatively non-toxic um, uh, form of embolization. And indeed, the short-term toxicity tends to be less, uh, but be careful uh, when you're doing both lobes, especially uh, if, the, if you're treating large parts of the liver, you can develop radioembolization induced liver disease. The liver becomes shrunk and cirrhotic. This can occur years after therapy. And so we've moved away from doing routine um, um, bilobar liver embolizations, particularly for patients with pretty slow growing tumors and long life expectancy. So to summarize, uh, for midgut neuroendocrine tumors, um, we typically start with a somatostatin analog. If they progress, if they have widespread metastatic disease, the second line therapy is typically with lutetium dotatate, peptide receptor radiotherapy. Uh, if they have liver dominant disease, we consider primarily liver embolization. If they're not candidates for lutathera or liver embolization, then, then in many cases, everolimus. For lung, colorectal, non-midgut GI and lung nets, um, have, you know, typically somatostatin analog if they express somatostatin receptors. Otherwise, any of these options is, is reasonable. And including uh, CAPTEM has some activity, particularly in lung nets, not as strong as pancreatic nets though. And then pancreatic nets is where we have the most treatment options, including Everolimus, Sunitinib, CAPTEM, which we typically use in relatively aggressive disease, PRRT, and you can consider liver embolization. And really trying to figure out how to sequence these therapies is, is, is one of the challenges we face. We really need more studies to help identify the right patient for the right treatment and teach us how to sequence these therapies best. <laughs>
And of course, even in metastatic disease, you always have to think about surgery, particularly if uh, the number of metastatic tumors is, is not huge and also resection of the primary tumor. And this is particularly pertinent for mid-gut nets, which, in which patients can often develop a long-term, in the long-term bowel obstruction, sometimes bleeding. They tend to live long. They often do better in the long-term if their primary tumor is resected. So just briefly mention some drugs on the horizon. Surfatinib is a TKI. It's fairly similar to sinitinib. Uh, two Chinese studies, one in GI lung nets and one in pancreatic nets showed improved PFS. Um, and so this drug may be approved in the United States in the near future. Linvatinib has been associated with particularly high response rates, especially in pancreatic nets in a phase two study. It is a tough drug though. The blood pressure spikes with this drug are quite remarkable. Axitinib uh, um, is, a, is a VEGF receptor inhibitor, uh, also associated with extended PFS, and a Spanish trial is evaluating Cignib versus placebo. And cabozantinib, another TKI, is being evaluated uh, both in pancreatic and non-pancreatic nets uh, in a large cooperative group study. Immunotherapy um, seems to play a relatively minor role in most well-differentiated nets. Single agent PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors, very low response rates, but Ipinevo combination uh, does have some activity in high grade um, tumors, particularly poorly differentiated. The exact response rate is hard to state. We haven't had good prospective studies yet, but in our experience, the response rate is probably about 10%, but some of these responses can be quite dramatic. Again, single agent PD-1 inhibitors and well differentiated nets are associated with, with pretty low response rate, less than 5%. So to wrap things up, um, as far as novel drugs, uh, some of the novel PRT agents, especially alpha emitters, likely to improve therapeutic index. Some of the new tyrosine kinase inhibitors may provide marginal to moderate benefit over sunitinib and everolimus. Um, and new immunotherapies are relatively ineffective in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, uh, but combination immunotherapy, ipinevo, may be modestly effective in high-grade or poorly differentiated uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas. And I haven't really talked about much about poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, but these are very aggressive cancers. Typically, the first-line treatment is platinum etoposide, and there is no standard second-line treatment, which is why uh, immunotherapy may increasingly play a role in that, in, the, in those cancers. So I think we have another 10 minutes um, to see if there are any questions. Appreciate, appreciate it. Everyone, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, to, to list them. Thank you, Jonathan, for the great talk, uh, very informative uh, with a summary of the neuroendocrine tumor management. Uh, if I may ask uh, one question, I know it's very difficult, uh, the sequencing question, and you mentioned that. Um, in the NETR1 trial, you included patients who were already exposed to some form of other therapy other than uh, octreotide analogs. And it seems like uh, if we give it later on in the uh, treatment, we're going to have uh, less uh, overall survival benefit. So are we saying that we have to up the PRRT to second line? Well, you know, the, the thing is, uh, as you know, with, with every cancer, as you go down the line of therapy, um, outcomes get worse. And that's true for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, just as it is for every other cancer. Um, so it's hard to it's hard to you know it's it's hard to know the right answer to that. All I can say is for mid gut nets, we don't have any other great systemic therapies. So if it's a choice between PRT and ovarolimus for yet, for example, for your average mid gut net, I would advocate for PRT. It's it it's. It's better tolerated, uh, better efficacy generally, um, and 
um, uh, you know, the, the impact and quality of life is, the negative impact and quality of life is minimal. In fact, there's data suggesting that, that quality of life outcomes are, are improved uh, with, with PRRT. So, so in that setting, it's relatively easy, but pancreatic nets, for example, it's really quite a conundrum to try to figure out how to sequence these, these therapies. All I can say is if your somatostatin receptor expression is negative, if you have a relatively aggressive tumor, then almost certainly capcitabine temozolomide is the appropriate uh, uh, treatment. But if they're relatively slow growing, if they express somatostatin receptors, you know, you can make an argument to treat with PRT early, you can make an argument to use the targeted therapy first and uh, save PRT for later, particularly given the long-term risk of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. One thing I do want to um, point out though, is that when you combine PRT and chemotherapy, either in combination or in sequence, there's probably a higher rate, not only of cytopenias, but also of um, myelodysplastic syndrome probably goes up to about 5% when patients are exposed to both temozolomide and PRT. Interestingly, what we found when we looked at almost 500 patients treated with cap unless they got PRT, they had no evidence of long-term um, myelodysplastic syndrome. But the, when they also received PRT, uh, that rate went up. I think we have some uh, Q&A questions. Uh, <clears throat> number one from uh, Dr. Reyes, thank you for your very informative talk. Can you discuss role of second line PRRT? Is this an approach you are using and how to select patients for this? Right, so the standard PRRT course of lutetium dotate consists of four cycles. Um, it's clear that patients can tolerate more than that. Um, and um, uh, what several studies, particularly from Rotterdam, have shown is that uh, um, if patients have had at least a year benefit, in other words, um, at least stable disease uh, for a year after completion of treatment, um, it's reasonable to go back and give additional cycles. What they do over there is give an additional two cycles. Uh, and what they see is basically half the benefit that they do with the first line treatment. So the response rates go down by half, the PFS goes down by half. And then sometimes they give you even a third course. So what they, they don't generally max out at, at eight cycles. And of course, as you give more and more, the benefit uh, decreases. But yes, you, you can retreat. Yeah. Another question, uh, do you use antifungals with steroids, uh, mouthwash, uh, support, no. whatever? Um, for Everlimus, we give uh, dexamethasone mouthwash prophylactically, um, but no, we don't give antifungals with that. And Dr. Waller, uh, great talk. Uh, we have noted that VIP is an immune suppressive neuro neuropeptide in urine models of viral infection and cancer, as well as human T cell in vitro. Have you seen any evidence of changes in immune function among patients with VPI formal? Jeez. Well, VIPoma, to uh, remind everyone, is an extremely rare uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, the incidence is about one in 10 million. They develop very severe diarrhea, uh, watery diarrhea associated with uh, electrolyte abnormalities as a result of the diarrhea. I have no idea whether uh, they have immunosuppressive issues, but they do respond well to octreotide. Dr. Lawson, any value of trying some of the nuclear medicine approaches in neuroendocrine tumor like small cell lung cancer or melanoma? Right. In between so our experience with uh, very aggressive, um, um, very aggressive gastrointestinal neuroendocrine cancers tells us that this, the, the, very, the very fast growing ones, number one, the somatostatin receptor expression is usually heterogeneous, not uniform. And number two, they tend to blow through PRT. So I would say the chances of small cell lung cancer responding to the PRT that that we're we're currently using is uh, is is very very low. Um, there are there, there is some research using different forms of PRT and melanoma, and I, I'm not sure exactly which receptor which receptor uh, they they're, they're targeting um, and. But, but at Moffitt, we're doing research using actinium, which is an alpha emitter, uh, PRT, and melanoma, but it's very early phase. 
And then the last question is uh, the use of placebo as a control and trial seems antiquated and the trial mentioned towards the end and could lead to loss of uh, uh, equipoise in enrollment. Uh, should placebos controls uh, versus an active agent be abandoned? So we still do use uh, placebo controlled studies in neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, you know, the only ethical way of doing this is if you're reaching the end of the line in terms of uh, standard approaches. So patients have received at least several standard lines of therapy, plus um, your, um, you know, you want to, you want to be hopefully confident that uh, you'll be able to, patients will be able to tolerate placebo for a period of time and then cross over. And I think if you meet those uh, criteria, um, um, use of placebo control is still acceptable. And really one of the only ways of proving that a drug is, is effective. Um, Cause sometimes we're talking about something being developed for, uh, you know, uh, not a, not an early line of therapy, but a late line of therapy. Um, so yeah, I think I think as long as you meet those criteria, it's acceptable still to use placebo. Uh, okay, I think that's. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was great, and uh, thank you. Like we're honored to have you, and to go over uh, on your endocrine tumor. Hope to see you soon. All right, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in person. Yeah, thank you.